I guess we are at time. So why don't we start? Yeah. No, okay. So the meeting is being recorded, as you know. Yes. And Amir, um, you just joined. Uh, actually, we have a bunch more. Sorry, uh, so I, sh I, sh I, sh I should introduce everybody. So it's Amir, Josh, Jawe Chen, Tyler, Shib, Sakin, Anna, uh, Prashant, and I may have missed some. Uh, so we, we have a, a decent group here, and I think this is great. Um, I'm Professor Mehrutra at Northwestern University. This is the first in what I'm hoping will be a more um, junior level uh, webinar series that would get started. The idea would be to promote uh, healthcare um, all across our leadership. Uh, of you know faculty leadership if, uh, and graduate student leadership um, through um, whatever I can do. So if many of you might know, we have a webinar that gets done through Informs that I I lead, um, where we are inviting more senior people, um, and we were just talking. We have got about a half a dozen or so um, the videos recorded there that go on YouTube. Um, the idea would be to have something similar uh, for this webinar as well, um, where the videos get recorded and they can become available for later viewing. Um, these videos we're gonna link through Center for Engineering and Health, which is something I direct through Northwestern, uh, Northwestern's effort. Um, so, uh, you know, and you kind of in the process of cleaning up the website, which was there from from some years back, and eventually the idea will be to try to start creating a hub of, uh, you know, all like-minded people who can be then supported for uh, their effort in research and in a, potentially even in education and other other activities through. The, the mechanisms that can be put in place. Okay, so uh, I guess with that, uh, I would want to introduce Hari, um, Hari Balasubramaniam. So Hari, uh, I have known for a very long time. Um, he just visited me earlier this year. We are putting together a monograph and they'll become available hopefully later this year or sometime early early next year. And as he was visiting, this whole idea about him giving a talk was being discussed, and it just sparked this whole idea then to say, do it at a scale where it's going to be more uh, valuable and more sustainable than to just do one event. Uh, and once that happened, I said, let's just go with it. Uh, you know, as a more senior faculty, I think that's he's trying to maximize the, the value. Okay, so Hari uh, is at Amherst, uh, an associate professor, and Hari has been doing his work in healthcare, in all aspects of health, healthcare, for a very, very long time. I think Hari now, what, 12, 14 years? Yeah, so since Mayo Clinic, it would be 16 years. 16, 16 years, yeah. so that is that is long. And uh, what I like about Hari is, is that he is passionate about doing work in this area in the right way. And, and that means that you have a problem and you look at the problem at its merit and do things that will that really are needed to solve the problem uh, rather than make you know trying to get a heavier tool um, to solve it or a lighter tool to solve it, solve it. Just do the right thing for the problem at hand and articulate the problem in a way that it is, uh, uh, it, it is accessible to, uh, um, to the audience. So I, I guess with that, Hari, uh, I'll have you take the, uh, you know, take over the presentation and uh, just yeah. the time is yours. Again, the format would be that anybody who may have questions along the way, uh, please feel free to stop um, and ask uh, those questions along the way. Uh, so this will be, I'm hoping that this will not be a huge group. Uh, so 
you know, the size of the group is just very manageable. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got access to the audio. So just uh, show self-discipline and uh, wherever you feel like you need a clarification, introduce yourself and ask. Okay, with that, Hari, why don't yeah. you uh, take the okay. floor? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. I appreciate you uh, inviting me to the Center for Engineering Health uh, first seminar uh, and organizing it and, and also enabling this forum, both through Informs, the other, other series, as well as this one. Uh, I think it's, it's really collecting a lot of diverse researchers from different parts of the country, uh, elsewhere too, who, who, and there's a collection of videos now on YouTube, which is becoming a valuable resource. So thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for Mohsen also for, for helping me uh, sort of do some of the um, uh, organization and the abstracts and other things for, for, uh, for this talk. Um, and thank you all for coming here, attending this talk uh, on, a, on a Monday. Uh, I know all of you are probably have, have other, a lot of other things to do and yet you, you've made the time to attend this. So this is some research uh, that, I wanna, that, I, that I'm gonna to present today is actually a collaboration between um, myself and two individuals from uh, computer science in, in UMass Amherst. Professor Peter Haas is, is he's a, full, a full professor at uh, computer science department. He's, uh, he happens, he's in computer science, he's working on a lot of database related problems, but he's also an informs person. He actually is a fellow of uh, informs and he's also done a lot of work in simulation and other, other, uh, other fields, sort of more classic operations research fields. Um, Pracheta is a PhD student in computer science, and, and, and so she approached Peter, and then I had come, uh, I had been studying this problem of multiple chronic conditions through data sets, and um, many of the problems I'd worked with were, were scheduling of capacity planning problems, but as I was beginning to look at data sets, I was starting to see the disproportionate impact of patients with multiple conditions, and uh, when I approached him, I was trying to find a framework with which to sort of describe this, because it was a very messy problem. And, and he had a lot of expertise in, in, in this use of maximum entropy. And this is a field that's also new to me. I'm still learning a lot about it. And, and so we sort of combined things together, our, our respective sort of um, areas of expertise together. And then we sort of created this thing, uh, this research, which is currently, I think we're revising this, this, this document for, a, for, a, for an informs journal. So uh, all comments are welcome. I think it's still it's still in the in process. Uh, and as it says, the prevalence of multiple chronic conditions or prevalence of, prevalence of chronic chronic diseases via maximum entropy. Um, so uh, I also want to acknowledge several students along the way who uh, have either contributed to this this particular research. A lot of the, all, all the students in the system, master students, who um, went through our program or, or the computer science program. And who um, um, who have contributed directly or indirectly to, to this research. Um, so what we I think is many of you who are, who are working in healthcare uh, probably know this that that we have um, uh, many patients who have multiple chronic conditions. Essentially, it's, uh, uh, Hari, Hari, if you don't mind pausing, yeah, yes, um, you know, for all those who are in the audience, yes, it if you can. It'll be great if you can turn on your videos because uh, at least we'll get to know each other through uh, photographs or, or, or videos. So I th the server should be able to handle it. Uh, um, so that's just a quick uh, plug uh, because this will be happening uh, on a regular basis. So I think it'll be nice to actually have a small community built uh, mm -hmm. uh, around it where people get to know each other. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. So this is for everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so when we speak about multiple chronic conditions, what we're referring to is the uh, presence of uh, two or more chronic conditions in an individual. Uh, if you look at the uh, report by Rand in 2017 on the prevalence of chronic conditions, and this is based off a data set that uh, called the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, which is also a data set that I will be using a lot and some in illustrating some of the results. So if you look at the numbers here, you have, um, you know, 40% of individual, 40% of the population has no conditions or no apparent conditions. Um, and that's good, you know, a large percent of the population is, is relatively healthy. Uh, and then, you know, you have 18% who have one, 13% who have two, 
uh, two chronic conditions and so on. And so the data gets very sparse at the tail. So essentially they aggregated this 12% so of the population, which is about 38 million Americans. So that's still a very large number, uh, have five or more chronic conditions. Uh, and if you, you know, it actually, if you, if you, you could look and you could say five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's actually, you know, it goes all the way uh, for a while. I think there are people with 12, 13. There, I've even seen an outliers, not outliers. I mean, individuals, actual individuals, with with 20, 27 conditions. Um, so anyway, so 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 this is this is uh, increasing as the uh, population ages, and um, you can also see the disproportionate impact of patients with multiple conditions. So. Those who have no conditions or are apparently healthy, uh, the 40% of the population, they contribute 10% of national health care expenditures. Whereas if you have three, four, or five conditions, uh, or three plus conditions, let's say, then you know the, they account for 67% of total national health care expenditures. Um, so you've got this uh, you know, tail that's getting smaller and smaller, but again, it's very, very high impact. On the other hand, it's not that small because uh, Nineteen percent have four or more chronic conditions, and that's that's like nearly sixty million Americans, uh, and so that's that's still uh, you know very high prevalence, you could say. Um, so so that's that's just a broad context. Uh, I'm going to describe to you uh, at the level of a person what what it sort of looks like. So this is an example of a particular person that I pulled from the medical expenditure panel survey, and, and there you actually have a, a history of a person of an individual for two years. So you can really assemble what happened to that person, what specialties they visited, what conditions they had, how they felt about their care, qualitative perceptions. There's lots of data in there. So in this one, what I'm showing you is a person who had multiple conditions, who had 79 office-based visits in a two-year period across 12 different specialties. This is the primary care, internal medicine, oncology, orthopedics, gastroenterology, urology, ear, nose, throat, um, rheumatology, dermatolo dermatology, and so on. So you've got this kind of satellite of specialists who the patient is seeing. And the patient also has uh, two inpatient stays in, in 2010, and there's 124 prescription refills. If we look at the prescriptions, they're likely to be complex because they're being probably prescribed by some subset of these specialists. Um, so when we saw in the last slide that you know they have a high patients with multiple conditions have a high impact, this is what happens. There's a lot of fragmentation of care across multiple specialties, uh, and, and that contributes a lot to costs, that contributes to hospitalizations, medication conflicts, and so on. So uh, I want to so, so I want to give you a little idea of what these combinations, multiple chronic condition combinations look like. I, and, and I think there's a uh, as I said, there's a long tail of complex patients. Um, and, and even though each individual combination has low prevalence, there are so many of them. There are so many combinations that there's a nice phrase for this, the high prevalence of low prevalence chronic disease combinations. So uh, there's, there's, there's just, you know, it just adds up because each one is maybe a thousand, two thousand, but it just, you know. Uh, so here, are, so again, these are based on clinical classification codes in the medical expenditure panel survey. Um, these are some lists, uh, you know, so this is somebody with one, two, three, four, um, five conditions. So this is one sort of combination where you can see high cholesterol, you see mental health conditions, you've got sort of musculoskeletal joint things um, going on. Uh, and then you've got sort of the usual triplet that we see a lot, diabetes, lipid metabolism disorders, or high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart, uh, connective tissue disease. Um, again, it's, 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 you see the, you see sort of a, what you're seeing in these lists is, is, is mixtures of diagnosis codes from multiple well-known clusters. You could call it the metabolic cluster, which is a diabetes, um, lipid disorders and, and high blood pressure cluster, respiratory. So for example, here you have, um, um, COPD, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, mental health. Uh, and so what you're seeing is these things mixing together. And I, I put a little dot, dot, dot here, but because if you create these lists, they would go on for pages and pages because there are so many of these combinations. They have some common features. It's not that there are no patterns, um, but but they are unique in the sense that, you know, each one, each patient has sort of almost like a unique set of, uh, or there are very few people with, 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 with these combinations, but there's a lot of them. So the current understanding of this is um, that uh, you know this is some 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 understanding of how what are the most common subsets, for example, what are the most common pairs of conditions, um, and the usual ones come up 
high blood pressure, um, uh, lipid disorders or cholesterol, uh, diabetes, heart, is, um, uh, mental health, the anxiety, depression come up a lot. So those pairs and triplets are fairly well known, but there's no systematic understanding of the long tail. Uh, and this long tail adds up, as we saw, to millions of patients, actually close to 60 million with four plus conditions. So what motivated the study is we need some kind of prevalence model on the co-occurrence of conditions. So if you have a list of conditions, let's say 15 or 20 conditions that commonly occur, what we would like to create is a prevalence model that says, what is the probability that you will get this, this, and this conditions, this group of seven conditions, this group of six conditions, so on. And why would that be useful? It would be useful in many ways. So it promotes our epidemiological understanding of how different groups of conditions might interact with each other, especially in this long tail or the four plus group. It might motivate to say, okay, how do medications interact across diseases? Because this is a big challenge for physicians, especially primary care physicians. They see individuals with many conditions and they have to sort of balance a lot of things in, in medication and treatment decisions. And these associations that we might get from a prevalence model might help us develop some guidelines, at least for the most common um, combinations. Um, coordination between different specialties. In, the, in that example, we saw that there were 12 different specialties involved in the single patient's care. So um, maybe you could sort of plan this out a little better so that there is no fragmentation of care and continuity is maintained. If you're going to do, uh, there's many groups around the country, and I'm also working with one in Camden, New Jersey, that is trying to develop interventions for this heterogeneous group of patients with multiple chronic conditions. Often there are other uh, social issues that go along with it. And so um, I think uh, how many social workers, nurses, uh, and other healthcare staff do you need to help these individuals out, for example, for home visits or enabling transportation, or this the whole, is a whole range of questions in there. So at a high level, that's what a prevalence model would be, would be beneficial for. Uh, and the challenge we face in creating a prevalence model is data sparsity and this combinatorial heterogeneity that I talked about. There are so many of these uh, combinations. Uh, and the majority of the combinations, so if you take a data set, whether it is a Medicare data set or a Medicaid or a VA data set, these are very large. Uh, or uh, if you take a um, you know, medical expenditure panel survey, which is the one I'm using, then we find that the, the, the combinations of four plus that we're seeing, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, those combinations that we're seeing are always generally new. They've never actually been observed in the past because you change one disease in a list and then you get a new combination, right? So I wanna give a little more evidence on this um, to, to sort of show this. I, I, I apologize to the graphs are, you know, there's this four different graphs here, um, but this is data for five years from the medical expenditure panel survey. Um, and I've listed here combinations that have three diseases, combinations that have four, combinations that have five, and combinations that have six. In total, there are about 22,000 unique combinations that we found in these five years. And what we're trying to present here is, is that, okay, so you have 8,351 combinations with three diseases. How many of those combinations appeared only in one year, one of the five years? How many of those combinations appeared in two of the five years? How many appeared in all five years? So this is about 150 of them actually that appeared in all five years. So there is a good deal of consistency. So those are very strong associations that persist from year to year. But even with combinations of size three, you see that the vast majority of combinations appear in, in only a single year. And if you go down to you know, five or six diseases that have combinations that have five or six diseases, them, you see that the vast, you know, you don't have any consistency at all. You, you, you see largely conditions that appear in one year, maybe two years, but, but essentially they're new. This is not to say that there aren't any patterns, but it's just the, if you, you know, if you switch a few diseases, you get a new combination. And so there are patterns, but uh, if you go by historical data and say that, okay, I have this data for this year, I'm going to predict next year's data, then this is not going to be a very good way of making that prediction or, or, or having a better understanding of what happens in this scale. Um, so, so that's the point about when I said data sparsity and combinatorial heterogeneity. Uh, and it's a challenge in creating prevalence models because you don't have enough data for different, um, uh, the joint occurrences of many diseases. I think there's a question here. Yeah, Amir in the, uh, is asking, are the graphs for any combination of diseases 
size three, regardless of the disease type. Uh, so there are 230, uh, 230 different clinical classification codes in the medical expenditure panel survey. And they are actually aggregates of the ICD-9 codes, which would make it even more granular. Uh, and so usually ICD-9, at the ICD-9 code level, it would, be, it would be very challenging. So usually there's a slight aggregation and that's what these are based on. So essentially, yeah. So is, I, I hope that answers your question, Ami. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, so what we would like uh, is to create a joint prevalence model is, 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 and what we mean by that is uh, what we have is, um, you know, some prevalence data involving N patients and D diseases. Um, and, you know, for example, one of the data sets we'll use in our case study has 62,000 individuals from the medical expenditure panel survey. Uh, and so you have essentially, you know, um, you know, this kind of data at the patient level where a disease, somebody has a disease or doesn't have a disease. Um, and, and, and so that's binary data that you have. And you would like to go from here to, um, to a, a, a prevalence model, which has basically two to the power D disease states. Uh, and so if you have 20, con 20 conditions that you're trying to investigate in this, which is, you know, actually there are 230 of them, but it's not possible to do that for that large number, but you can do it for 20 most common conditions, for example. Uh, even there, you would, you would have to estimate, estimate something like a million probabilities. Now, not all of those disease states are necessarily needed, but many of them are indeed relevant. And they have not been observed historically. Uh, as I just showed in the previous graph, many of the combinations are new. Uh, and so if you went purely by data in the past, um, you would erroneously estimate zero prevalence for unobserved diseases. It might not matter for many combinations which are truly uh, very, very rare, but there are many that are relatively likely, but just haven't been observed. And so there's, you would sort of miss a very large number uh, of conditions this way. Uh, so you might say, okay, that's maybe a problem with the medical expenditure panel survey. It's, not, it's a survey, it's sampling 30,000 people every year. So is this um, how does it work if you have larger uh, data sets like Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Affairs? Um, so that, that, that would be, uh, you know, certainly there would be more data there. Uh, but they also face the problem because you would often have to slice by demographics, which is really, we haven't done that in this particular study, but you would have to slice by demographics. And once you bring in that sparsity, uh, inevitably becomes an issue. So, uh, or if you go from a particular classification code to, to categorize diseases like clinical classification codes to ICD-9 codes, which are more granular, then once again, you have a sparsity issue. So we, we, we can't seem to completely do away with the sparsity issue, even with very large, um, very large data sets. So, um, so, so how do we go about this? As I said, you know, one, the common approach in the literature is to use, uh, just, you know, observe what has been uh, there in the past and, and mindful patterns in it. But there's, to the best of our knowledge, there's no prevalence model. Um, that has been proposed yet. Uh, and so what we said, you know, that's what this is where uh, my collaborator, Peter Haas's sort of inputs came in. And so I had been doing this and showing him this chaotic list of combinations. And, and, and so he said that, you know, maybe we could try uh, a maximum entropy approach, which is being used a lot in um, NLP, natural language processing, ecology, many other domains um, to sort of say, okay, um, create this prevalence distribution. And so what is the maximum entropy and what is the main idea behind it? The, um, and I think I've found many quotes from it, uh, but this one is, is one I sort of liked. Uh, given a collection of facts, uh, choose a model consistent with all the facts, but otherwise as uniform as possible. Um, so uh, the idea is that uh, if, you, if you have a, uh, if you want to create a prevalence distribution with two to the power D disease states, if you just allow maximum entropy to do its own thing, it would just say that all disease states are equally likely. Uh, and that's not something very uh, meaningful. So what you want to do is you want to um, be as uniform as possible, maybe, that, that's fine. But you also want to impose certain relationships in the data as constraints. And what are those relationships? Those relationships are, uh, there are clear associations between chronic conditions that are present in the data. They have, uh, there's higher associations between, uh, for example, um, between the conditions that form the metabolic conditions like uh, diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. Uh, it turns out that joint disease has, uh, joint disorders have high associations with high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. So we know these sort of lower level associations 
of involving four diseases, three diseases, two diseases, even, even five diseases that are relatively consistent and are well established. You want to use those facts and input them as constraints into your model. And then allow the maximum entropy to sort of assign within those constraints, assign as uniformly as possible. So one of the benefits of this, well, you know, I'm not saying that this is the best approach. It's one systematic approach, at least. It's it's uh, um, it gives something that's making no assumptions other than these facts, and it's assigning everything as uniformly as possible. And of course, the quality of the constraints will determine our uh, quality of the facts or the uh, the constraints that we could give to this model. Uh, maximum entropy model will will determine our um, the quality of our prevalence distribution. So. Um, so yes, I'm going to use the term facts and constraints because I'm going to show you a maximum entropy optimization where the constraints are these associations or these well-known facts between diseases. So let me give a three disease example uh, in this particular case, um, just for the formulation so that, you know, uh, when I had spoken with Sanjay earlier, uh, this was one reason, you know, uh, maybe the students in this group or anybody could sort of clearly see what's going on, what's, what's, what's happening in this Example, so you have, um, you know, let's say there are three diseases, in which case there are only eight states to estimate. Um, you have the no prevalence, no disease prevalence state, uh, those with exactly just one disease one and not either of two and three. And this is individuals with all three diseases. So those are the eight states. Uh, and the maximum entropy objective function looks like this. Um, uh, you know, it's negative log P uh, summed over all the outcomes. Uh, all the discrete outcomes. In this case, we're thinking of discrete distribution. Um, so, uh, so that would be the entropy that we're trying to maximize. Um, and if you didn't specify any constraints into the model, each of these disease states would get a, a one eighth probability, which uh, is is obviously not interesting. That that's just the unconstrained case. But let's say that you introduce uh, some constraints. Uh, let me see here. So the first constraint we can say is, okay, maybe we have some idea of the probability of people who are apparently healthy. Um, those estimates are relatively decent. And I use the approximate sign here because you may want to not overfit to the data. You may want some flexibility around that value uh, of, 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 of no disease uh, prevalence incidence. Um, the no disease proportion, so you, you, can, you can impose that. Uh, if you introduce, um, more constraints. So for example, you say the disease one has a certain prevalence AD1 in the population, and that's fairly well known. The Many of the diseases, we actually know the incidence. So how would this constraint look? This would say disease one is part of that vector, one, zero, zero. It's also uh, a subset here. So it, you know, disease one can occur with disease two and not disease three. Uh, it can occur with disease three and not disease two. Um, and so, uh, and then of course you can have all three diseases together. So disease one also occurs in this situation. So you would say that the probability of these four variables should add up to the incidence, which is sort of a higher level aggregate marginal measure of disease one incidence in the population. And so you can keep on adding more constraints, the more, you know, maybe there are more things, you know, maybe you can do that for disease two, which again would associate different variables, um, uh, different probability variables um in 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 this in this constraint and then we can look at that for disease three uh now let's say you want to uh, 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 you want to involve like uh pairs of conditions so you also know associations between d1 and d2 and so if you introduce that um you now have d1 and d2 and d1 and d2 is it can occur just by themselves uh, or it can occur uh, along with the third disease. So, you know, so probability of R4 uh, and probability of R7 would equal to the disease one and two incidence that is observed. Again, approximately, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and so you can keep specifying this. Obviously, with three diseases, there's not much more to specify. If you specify everything, you essentially specify the entire distribution that you, you already have. Um, but let's say we pause here, and then, and then you just want to add, okay, the probabilities add up to one, and if you solve now this problem, the original problem, it would have given you one eighth probability without constraints. But now as you keep adding constraints, you start to leverage the structure that exists in the associations between conditions. And what structure you do not specify is assigned as uniformly as possible according to the maximum entropy principle. So that is the underlying idea of this, um, uh, of this method. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look, we can look at this in, in a little more detail now. 
Um, so if you if you um, now think about this, so so you have in, in a more formal uh, uh, way, you can say the p is sort of that um, um, that probability distribution, and p of r is the specific uh, the probability of a specific um, uh, disease state, those binary uh, disease states. And this is the full R is the full set of all two to the power D disease states. And, and FC is a constraint that tells you whether uh, um, whether a particular subset is, uh, whether a particular combination is a subset of R or not. Those are the places where we added those probability variables. Um, so it's just the zero one indicator variable. Uh, and then what the right-hand side, instead of having an equality, instead of trying to equate it to the known disease incidence, what we're doing here is we are um, um, saying that it can fall it can fall in an interval that the probability should fall in an interval and that interval is n is the total number of uh, um, data points we have and w is that constant that we need to figure out uh, we ended up with a value of one being pretty good for many cases but that's just you know an upper and lower bound a small interval in which these probabilities should fall uh, and so this is the max end problem with 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 inequality um, constraints. And there's a long history of this. This is not this by itself. Constraint max into maximum entropy problems are, by, are not new. Uh, I learned all this just, just going working with uh, my collaborators, uh, collaborator Peter Haas. Uh, and, and essentially, the equality constrained maximum entropy has, uh, has been um, um, studied. Uh, and the inequality one was done by Kazama and Suji, which, which is what we sort of uh, were inspired by as we created our formulation. And so what do we, how do we solve this? Uh, you typically don't solve the primal that I showed you in the other page and you don't solve this problem. Um, you, you, um, you, you, so you end up solving the dual, which I'll describe now how that's done. Um, I'll just have an outline of how that's done. So essentially you take this max center with inequality constraints. This is just a rewriting of the problem just so that everything is aligned uh, in terms of the inequalities and, and the equality that everything should, should sum to one, all the probabilities. And from there, you sort of define a Lagrangian where you take the uh, the original objective function, and then you have these uh, Lagrangian multipliers. One for the uh, this set of constraints that is less than the the eight, you know I would say this set of constraints V C, and then lambda C is for the uh, less than equal to set of constraints here. So these are the multipliers for those constraints, uh, and then this multiplier is for that last constraint here. Um, so you take the Lagrangian and then um, you can sort of do some algebraic uh, manipulation after taking the derivatives and you get a parametric form for the probability, you get an estimate for the probability of each disease state, which, which looks like this expression here. Um, the Z here is this, this, this uh, expression here, the Z that appears here. Uh, and what you then do is then you 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 do further um, you further work on uh, the equations you get after taking the derivatives of the Lagrangian, and then you get a dual formulation. Uh, and then this dual formulation is what eventually gets solved. And the dual formulation is in in terms of the lambda c's and the vc's, which are the multipliers. And it's an unconstrained nonlinear optimization problem, and uh, it is solved. Uh, or at least uh, when I so Pracheta, uh, she used an implementation in Python to 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 solve this uh, problem. So um, so that's that's sort of the outline of this. Again, I think the what's new here. So many of these things are well established. What's new here is how we are bringing in sort of the disease prevalence context and how we're introducing constraints into the into the maximum entropy formulation. So constraint generation. Yes, uh, is that a Sorry, Sanjay, I can't hear you. I think is were you saying something? All right, I I think I'll continue if if, if if that's okay. It looks like there was some comment, but we maybe we can we can um, deal can with you, it. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Okay, sorry, so probably the the switch got off or turned off. No, I I have the uh, privilege of having access to the microphone. Everybody else has to type in their questions. Oh, okay. so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you go back, I mean, optimization is my bread and butter on the other side. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and and actually that would keep would be one of my weaker things. Uh, no, 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 it is. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you, we we don't have to have strength in everything, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, the question is uh, the following, right? Yes. I mean, if you look at 
the previous slides, uh, in the previous slides, the number of combinations yes. were combinatorially large. Yes. Right? So don't worry, you don't have to uh, flip yeah. that. Yeah. Right? I think we'll all agree with that, right? Now in this yes. formulation, yes. you're enumerating all the combinations. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So far. Yes. Uh, have you, first of all, maybe you already have a formulation of the POM model where the combinations are not enumerated uh, or they're selectively enumerated? Mm -hmm. is, is is there uh, something like that uh, that you have or uh, is you, you only are assuming that these combinations will be enumerated. So can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think this would be very, it would be very interesting and powerful if we can actually sure. eliminate, uh, enumerate only some. And, and, and so we, we allow the number of possible combinations to be infinite, very large. Uh -huh. and, and, and I think we don't do that right now. And actually- Okay, uh, fair um, enough. You, yeah. you, answer, you answered my question and I think this should be possible to do it. So yeah. uh, if you want to chat, I'll, I'll be more than happy to help you on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's, yeah, that's a great it should, point. It should be possible. Because because it's, uh, yeah, the, the heterogeneity is fast. We take 20 diseases, you can do that, but actually- It, it, it should be possible. Yes. Yes, yeah, so let's go back to, yeah, so 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 I've described the formulation, and this is the um, process of generating constraints that I'm going to talk about now. Um, so if you've uh, come across some unsupervised learning techniques that are called, uh, um, a frequent item set mining or association rule mining or market basket analysis. Uh, essentially, you take a, a binary um, a data set with binary features, in this case, the diseases one or zero. And what you're doing with market basket analysis or frequent item set mining are like, you know, what are the most common dyads? What are the most common triads? Uh, not the full combinations, but what are the subsets that appear most frequently? And uh, there are many algorithms for this. There's the a priori algorithm, which is a famous one, very well cited. There's a faster one that uh, we used for this one. It's called FP growth algorithm that basically lists all chronic condition subsets that have sufficient support in the data set. The support is, we want sufficient support because those are trustworthy associations between diseases. Um, there's of course the clinical way of doing it and a pure data way of doing it. And when you're doing it only based on data, it's really what has a reasonable support in a data set. Uh, so we find the patients who have those diseases, that subset of diseases, divide them by the total number of patients, and that would be the subset of that dyad or triad or uh, quartet or quintet and so on. Uh, and so we include those ones that have higher than some value S. Um, the, the, I want to give you some examples of the triplets with high support. Um, as I said, the, the disease combinations are very heterogeneous a lot. But they have very common features. You've got the you've got diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which in a data set of sixty two thousand appears fifteen twenty three times. Um, connective tissue disorders, joint disorders, spondylosis. This is uh, you know that occurs two hundred and thirty two times. Uh, we've got a quartet here where um, the the three that we are familiar with in the in the triplet combines with joint disorders. Um, and, it's, and that the prevalence of that is 348 out of out of 62,000. So these are some actually we actually have 145 different uh, dyads, triplets, and quartets. Uh, I'm just giving you a sample of these. So essentially, what you have if you have 20 diseases, you would have 145 constraints that they are based on mining these associations, and and then you input them into the into the uh, Maxent model. So, um, so the next stage of this is um, the difficulty with creating a prevalence distribution. You can create one, but how do we know that it is actually correct? It's, 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 there is no prevalence model out there in the literature um, for the very same reasons that we are not able to create one easily. So how do we compare what the Maxent produces? So for this reason, we needed to create a large range of plausible synthetic data sets. Uh, and um, the, the advantage of these synthetic data sets is they're created out of a ground truth distribution, which means that we actually know the probabilities of the two to the power of these states. And because we know that, we can then generate data sets from this, uh, from this distribution. Um, obviously, uh, we, won't, we, we can generate data sets of differing sizes, different sizes, different diseases. Uh, so we can generate that. We know the true probability distribution, the population distribution. 
then we can compare how Maxent does with uh, maximum likelihood estimates. Uh, and uh, what we also make sure is in creating these synthetic data sets, we keep or retain as many features as we can. Obviously, you can't generate, have a generative process that is as accurate, but you can, you can at least keep the main features. For example, I'm going to show you two features that, um, that um, we sort of retain. One is an exponential drop-off. So essentially, you have people with zero conditions is a high probability. And then people with, with, with one condition, um, you know, is, 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 is that data point there, two conditions, and so on. So we see this very consistently, this kind of um, exponential drop and fits beautifully an exponential fitted curve fits nicely with this um, uh, with this kind of kind of trend but we, we don't want to just keep one thing we want to vary this a little bit because maybe the scaling is different um, the data set sizes are different but we keep this basic pattern um, population level pattern we also keep the idea that maybe there are different clusters of diseases with sort of some conditions that also overlap between them. For example, joint disorder seems to belong to the musculoskeletal autoimmune cluster, but it also belongs, seems to appear a lot with diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. So there are some overlapping conditions, but they are also these clusters. So we were, we were these synthetic data sets keep some of these sort of features. Um, and, um, and, and then we are now able to um, evaluate the performance of these data sets. Um, we were also able to learn what is a good support value that is good for, for various parameters and combinations of these, of these features. And then remember the fact that we don't, we try not to overfit, we try to fit to the, uh, we have this interval in which the probabilities should lie, what should be that width of that interval, we can learn those types of things from the synthetic data sets. Um, so, um, so, so we do that, and 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 there's actually it's a very involved section. I could probably, uh, again, um, it'd be uh, we'd be talking about it for a very long time. But I want to give you a little summary of uh, what we found. Um, so we have let's say 2,100 synthetic data sets that we've generated with all these different parameters. We tried to comp uh, we tried to compare the Maxent MCC distribution, multiple chronic conditions distribution with the ma maximum likelihood distribution, but we also know the ground truth distribution from which this data was generated. So we can compare how Maxent performs in relation to the ground truth. How does MLE, which is empirical estimation, perform in, in relation to this ground truth? And a way to quantify how two distributions are similar or not, we use uh, the Jensen-Shannon distance um, which actually is a kind of weighted measure of what is known as the kullback liebler divergence measure. And essentially it compares every point, uh, every, uh, so if you have two distributions with the same sort of set of outcomes, it, it, you know, it computes the log. It's very common in information theory. Uh, and, and it gives a measure between zero and one, which tells you if it's closer to zero, you're closer to the ground truth. And if you're closer to one, the farther away you are from the ground truth. And so this is a box plot of um, these are two box plots, one with the Maxent MCC, and then this is the uh, maximum likelihood distribution um, based on empirical frequencies. And we see that uh, the Maxent MCC uh, generally performs fairly well. It's closer to the ground truth distribution, values closer to zero mean uh, a good fit. Uh, it's, 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 it's doing better, at least in synthetic data for compared to, uh, compared to uh, the MLE. So, um, uh, so this this essentially is the full procedure. Uh, I mean, essentially, we have we have our disease data set. We are going to extract some features, learn the support values, and from the learned support values, we get a value of support that we can then use to mine constraints. And then we fit the we run the Maxent uh, model. Uh, we get the probabilities of the two to the power of these disease states, uh, and that's that's the that's sort of the full procedure out here. Uh, and so we call it the Maxent MCC uh, algorithm. Um, it kind of puts it all together. So um, synthetic data is very good and the procedure is very good, but the final test of this is how well it applies in practice uh, and how reasonable the results are. And so essentially we went back, collected, uh, we, we applied it to a data set over five years from uh, MEPS, about 62,000 patients. Uh, in MEPS, there are 230 clinical classification codes Two to the power of 230, we're still not in that world yet. Um, so we took uh, the 20 most prevalent chronic diseases for our analysis. Um, and, and that still gives you sort of the most 
if you, by choosing the most prevalent, we still hopefully see some of the patterns that we, we would like to see. And we have several applications, which I'm going to go through now. Um, uh, uh, they, they kind of come at, come at it from different perspectives. Um, the constraints that we use, so we got a support value from a synthetic data. We learned the support value using a machine learning model, and that gave us a value of 0 0.0029. What it really translates to is in a data set of 62,000, if a subset of diseases is observed um, more than 177 times, then we're going we're gonna to include it into the model. And this resulted in a total of 145 constraints, pairs, triplets, and quartets. I would have gone a little bit more uh, if I had just intuitively done this. I would like to put some quintets, which seem to be uh, relatively, I think we could, and that's where the clinical information would come in. But purely from a machine learning type thing, these are the constraints we added. And again, those are the example con examples of those 145 constraints. Uh, so the first application I'm going to talk to you is estimation at the very tail of the distribution. Um, and this is a little more aggregate level estimation. So um, where in our data set, we have people with 8, 9, 10, 11 diseases. So it stops there. And so the question is, obviously, this is a survey. And so you would have missed people with 12. There probably are people in the population with 12 or more. Not that many, but I think you know it's still worth calculating what that is. So if you went purely by the data, you would say the prevalence would be zero. Uh, using Maxent, the results of the Maxent, we are able to say that there, as an estimate, is there are 30, 13,500 individuals with 12 or more uh, chronic conditions. Uh, and if you extrapolate their cost, and it turns out that the cost uh, mean cost by chronic condition follows uh, a linear pattern with uh, um, a $2,000 increase, $2,100 increase for every chronic condition you add. Now, there's a lot of variation around it, but the mean actually follows this pattern. So if you extrapolate this for uh, people with 12 diseases or higher, then those 13,500 individuals at the very tail of the distribution would account for $357 million in annual expenses. So again, that's because you, you get the tail has higher and higher impact. And then we see that here. Um, and 13,500 is a small number in relation to 320 million in, 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 in the US population. But still, it is, it is uh, in the thousands of people around the country who, who might have these many conditions. Uh, so, you, you, so this was the this was an aggregate level estimation of what, what, um, uh, what might be happening in the tail. You can also create lists of unobserved but relatively likely combinations. I, you know, it's a long table with a lot of elements in it, but it. So this. So we created a list where we had the top twenty-five combinations uh, that we that are unobserved in the data set but have relatively high prevalence. They account for about three hundred and sixty-nine thousand um, total individuals in the U.S. And um, you know, I'm, I'm listing a few of them here. Uh, and if I look here, uh, how plausible are they? So if I take this one here, you've got, this is actually COPD. Uh, and so here you've got that thing where, um, you know, you've got the mixtures of sort of the metabolic conditions. You've got uh, the joint disorders, which again correlates with that. You also have COPD, which, which we've seen in previous cases does mix with these. So this wasn't observed in the data set, but it is a plausible uh, combination. So you have an entire database now, which you can search to see what might be uh, unobserved but relatively likely. Another one that I feel like you know has has a relatively high sort of plausibility might be something like that, or says any number of these that that um, would be up to clinical investigation. This may or may not happen. You know, this is just a a way for people to investigate whether these things these things are possible. Um, so so there's two more two more results, and then I think I'm getting to the close. I think that these are from different perspective. Um, so if you're a primary care physician, you have a panel of patients, and in that panel, you have very often you have multiple patients with multiple chronic conditions, you're likely to encounter combinations that you've never observed before, um, especially somebody who's practicing in rural areas, they don't have access, and the data sets tend to be very small. Um, so for example, you might have somebody who comes to your practice who has diabetes, heart disease, depression, and asthma. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plausible combination. There are thousands of these, and so these might present at, at, at offices in primary care across the country. 
there's no systematic method for saying, given that you have this quartet, what is the risk of other chronic conditions? As a basic prevention measure, you have four, we don't want any more. And what would be our strategies to avoid any further escalation, right? So uh, the conditional risk for these, so the problem with empirical estimate is that this happens in the data set only for five individuals. And so, you know, it's going to be very noisy. Um, and so what you see in the, so this is the quartet that I'm talking about, and maybe there's a better way to visualize this, but you've got this quartet and there's 16 other conditions that sort of a satellite surrounding it. What you see is a conditional risk for uh, people with this quartet in the brackets, you see the MLE estimate, maximum likelihood estimate, which has only five data points. So it's, it's fractions, it's multiples of 0.2. Uh, and so it's a little bit ridiculous because you get 0.2, one. And so it's very noisy, obviously. Sometimes it overestimates, sometimes it underestimates. And then it also gives a value of zero for five conditions. It says that there is no risk for um, thyroid or spondylosis or upper respiratory infections. So uh, whereas Maxent, which you see outside, these values are the conditional risk estimates for the Maxent model. Because it has used these associations as constraints between these various combinations of diseases, the pairs, triplets, and quintets, it is smoothing the distribution out and is giving you some plausible risk values. The spondylosis discrepancy where it says the Maxent says 0.33, MLE says empirical estimate is zero. This is probably the most significant discrepancy because if you look at the data set, spondylosis does indeed occur in many cases with some of these uh, conditions. There's also clinical literature that I found that there is uh, some correlation between at least uh, some of these conditions and spondylosis. So a risk of zero would certainly be not a good estimate. Whether 0.33 is too much or too little, we still don't know, but at least it gives a framework for systematically looking into this. We can also look at how different, so as I, I think I made the point earlier that you've got conditions that are combinations that are mixtures of different uh, diseases. So you've got, let's say, a metabolic cluster, which is well known, the autoimmune, autoimmune musculoskeletal cluster, mental health, respiratory. Uh, so you can use a measure called LIFT, uh, which is a common metric used in association rule mining. And so the LIFT is, if you have a set of diseases A, and if you have a set of diseases B, um, then the LIFT of A and B is um, probability of the intersection divided by the product of the individual prevalences of the two, A and B. So if the A and B are relatively independent of each other, then you'll get lift values close to one. If, if they are dependent on each other, you get higher than values that are much higher than one. Um, and you see that the metabolic cluster seems to associate at least uh, based on Maxent results with the autoimmune musculoskeletal structure more than it does, but there is also an association it seems between the respiratory cluster and the metabolic cluster. Not so much with the mental health uh, ones, it looks like a weaker association. And you know, these are all just uh, speculations. There is some clinical verification of some of these things. I found some papers, but the idea is to use this either to validate things that, are, that clinicians are already doing with meta-analysis and, and, and uh, recommending physiological mechanisms, or you could systematically generate pairwise lift values that are high. And then those would be used to um, then say, okay, let's test this hypothesis. Is this true or not? So you could use this for sort of this epidemiological purposes involving, involving these sort of larger clusters. So um, I think, uh, so those are four applications and I still, you know, my, my mind is still been churning out. There probably are many other ways of looking at this. Um, but in conclusion, uh, I think um, we're, we're getting close to my time limits here. So in conclusion, um, you know, we have a systematic method, a uh, principled approach to create a prevalence model for co-occurring conditions. Uh, we're sort of combining maximum entropy with frequent additional mining, which is an association rules, and a synthetic data generation scheme to, to kind of um, uh, to achieve this. And we have several plausible results from our maxent. Uh, that doesn't say that it's, 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 it's still to be verified, but it's somewhat, uh, it's, it seems like a useful, um, useful approach. Uh, we have not, and I think that could be a major criticism, is that we haven't really included demographic features. Uh, you know, you may want to segment it. You may want to create a Maxent model for 65 and older by gender, by race, by... And, and actually, the data is going to get more sparse as you do. That's the Maxent will even more come into play um, as, 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 as we look into those. 
Uh, I have been discussing this with physicians. Um, I think we are still in a very early stage. So I think, uh, you know, it's still, it's still a ways to go. There's a physician at Stanford University, Donna Zulman, who's been looking into this very closely. I hope to be more in contact with her to see if any of these could be useful. And uh, we looked at things with different conditions and multiple chronic conditions, but you could also take ICD-9 codes. There are many of them typically related to one cluster, of one disease, and maybe try to apply this to that as well. Um, so uh, with that, I think uh, I will pause. Uh, thank you for um, coming again, attending this. I appreciate it very much. Uh, there are 16 participants. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy in this day. It's not easy to... Uh, on video to listen to people. So um, yeah, thank you. This is great, uh, Hari. This is a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, this truly was a wonderful talk. And I yeah, think there's a, yeah. lot, lots of possibilities here uh, down, down the road, both the methods and applications. Many were churning in my own brain. Mm. So uh, before I, uh, let me make a couple of comments. This is a small team. I think at some point we had uh, yes, yeah, six, seven, 16, 17 participants, because mm -hmm. maybe one, one, one or two dropped. But it'll be great. Uh, I, I'm going to have Mohsen uh, give me some helping hands here. Uh, if many of you uh, who are in the audience, uh, if you feel like you want to present, or you have somebody you would like to listen to. So I would like to really develop it like a community thing. Uh, you know, this whole webinar series. So I've got a couple of speakers lined up already uh, beyond this particular, uh, you know, Hadith talk. Uh, reach out to Mosin and copy me on that email. So I'm going to try to vet it out. You know, uh, unfortunately, not everybody might be able to get a chance uh, depending on how this comes. But, uh, uh, but the idea would be to try to make sure that people get a platform to talk about work that they're doing, which is very interesting to them. I uh, think that it's important, but doesn't necessarily find the platform uh, for it to be presented uh, because it, gets, it just goes in a journal and dies in a journal of sorts, right? So that's not the idea. The idea here is to really harness our collective uh, wisdom as we're working on things. I mean, for me, healthcare is a passion. And improving healthcare systems, like you know, something I, I dream to be doing, and all of these things go a long way in that direction. So uh, please follow up on that part. Uh, but in that, uh, otherwise, uh, so Mosin's put his email uh, in the in the chat, and I think we'll have your emails uh, because you you somehow signed up for this. So we'll we'll see exactly whether we have access to your emails or not. So we'll reach out and we'll start uh, forming a, a small uh, group of sorts, uh, like a listserv of sorts, so that we don't spam. And next talk that is coming, uh, you know, you would know that through that listserv and 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 then also through Inform's uh, notification board. Okay. So this is the very first. Uh, are there any questions? And we can go a little bit over. We don't have to be ending right at noon. Um, noon central. Yes, and Josh. Yes, Josh uh, Gladstone. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Josh is a, a PhD student starting at the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass. Uh, he was a master's student in uh, with uh, with us in, in in IUR, and he actually worked on an independent study, which was a very good, and that sort of informed much of my thinking, and that's why I invited him to this talk. Um, do you recall the support level used with FP growth found to be the most effective? Um, so the FP growth algorithm was implemented by Pracheta. Uh, and I have, you know, we've done the a priori algorithm uh, a lot and then we use it in R. So when I do it, I use the a priori. So, um, so maybe your question is directed with the idea that if you make the support very small, you're going to get a lot of, you're going to be able to list a lot of subsets. And so, and that takes time and it gets computationally hard. And so the question is, um, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I can certainly find that out and we can, we can, yeah. So, but, but uh, is that the, what was that where you were going with that question? Yep. <laughs> That's what it says. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Well, if, uh, if not, then, um, 
you know. Actually, as, as, Amir has a question. So. Uh, okay, how, how about you? Uh, Amir, sorry, Miss. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes Amir, yes, good yes. to see ah, you. Okay. Uh, Amir was a former student, now he's a faculty member in, you yeah. know. Yes, uh, I had the in, pleasure in, uh, of having Harry and my uh, dissertation uh, like nine years ago, I believe. Yes, yes. So thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation and thank you uh, to the organizers of the uh, webinar series. Uh, so my question, actually, the question that I was going to ask, uh, I think Harry listed beautifully in under like future work and mm -hmm. sort of the shortcomings of the model. Yes, I understand that the model is going to get a lot more complex if you include, uh, like you said, the demographic inf information or the cost information. But I think uh, from, a, let's say, an insurance company's perspective, when you're looking at the numbers, uh, let's say your linear cost equation that you presented, then definitely those information such as, you know, the frequency of the occurrence of those uh, conditions or the number of visits or uh, uh, let's say the age and the other information that you said are going to be extremely important. Again, understand yeah. how uh, complicated the model and the yes. data set will get. Yes. But I'm glad yeah. that you listed that. And, yeah, I think it's a it's a we we actually attempted that in a diff, in different projects and um, predicting yeah it, it becomes very hard and even like um, uh, the models do not have much uh, you know very high accuracy in fact in predicting cost this was very aggregate level trend that was relatively stable but if you yeah put in more things uh, maybe the mean might be decently even if if at all the mean might be decently predicted but the variation around it you know because people are they, you know the Outcomes are so different amongst even with a certain subpopulation. Yeah. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Thank you, Amir. All right. If uh, if not, then let's end the conversation. Uh, this will be like a conversation, um, of course, with somebody at the core for presenting. Uh, but let's give her a, a, um, a virtual clap. So I, I, you know, I, I would say that this is one good thing that's come out of COVID. Unfortunately, with all the bad things that yes. have happened, yes. right? that we can do these things yes. where, you know, diverse people can come, yes. people at diverse locations yes. can come together, yes. and we have these smaller forums that can be formed. This would be virtually impossible if you were to do this physically. Yes. So I mean, again, as I said before, uh, if you like the talk, I think this is going. This is a great talk at exactly the right level mm -hmm. for the for the. Web for this webinar series, so send uh, me an email and 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 most copy Mosin on that, and then also um, uh, if you have suggestions, be more than happy to entertain it. Uh, okay, uh, again, this is community. We like to make sure that things progress. That I think collectively we can do a lot together. All right. Okay. Great. Thank, you. Great. Thank you very much, Sanjay and uh, Mohsin for organizing this. This is, yeah, I, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Thank All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye.